Washington Journal continues. We want to welcome back to our table Bill Ellison, Editorial Director with the Sunlight Foundation, here to talk about fundraising and campaigns, the 2014 congressional elections uh, around the corner here. Uh, let's just begin with what rules are currently in place for a member of Congress wanting to fundraise. There, I mean, what's amazing is there really aren't that many rules about how members of Congress can go about this. Some of them hold events. Some of them uh, use direct mail. Uh, there's a whole range of ways that members can raise money. But the basic rules are for contributions, an individual can now give $2,600 per election. That's 2600 for the primary, 2600 for the general election. PACs can do the same, except they can give up to $5,000. Uh, members of Congress can help raise money for the parties, which can take uh, more than $30,000 from an individual. And they can also work with super PACs, these you know outside organizations, as long as the member doesn't ask for more than he could raise for, say, a, a political action committee. So they can ask for $5,000 to go to a super PAC. Uh, they're not supposed to coordinate their um, uh, spending with the super PACs, but they can coordinate fundraising. Um, one of the big ethics rules that came in uh, after 2007 when the Democrats came in and took over the House and the Senate was a change in what lobbyists are allowed to do for members of Congress. One of the things that they couldn't do was host lunch events. There's a glaring exception to that. They can do it for fundraisers. Uh, and you know you have uh, all sorts of different rules. One of our favorites is the toothpick rule that as long as the food can fit on a toothpick, it's fine for a lobbyist to pay for it. Um, you know, we have pictures of uh, events where there's, you know, Kobe steak and uh, expensive seafood on the ends of toothpicks. So, uh, you know, that's one way that they can get around ethics rules. But generally speaking, you know, members are uh, very free to do fundraise any way they want. And they really don't have to disclose very much about how they go about raising money, which I think is one of the reasons why we started the Party Time site. Which is, explain that. We do a site called it's politicalpartytime.org. It's uh, we basically have sources around town. It sort of started in uh, 2000. It originally went online in 2008, but I first started doing it in 2006 when a, a friend of mine who worked for a firm here was complaining about how his fax machine was overwhelmed by invitations to congressional fundraisers, and I heroically volunteered to take them off his hands, and that's sort of how Party Time got started. And now we have over 18,000 invitations to events all over Washington, D.C. Uh, the bulk of them are in Washington because most of our sources are there, uh, are here. Um, and we would love it, though, if we could get more people to contribute fundraisers. You know, these events happen all over the country. And if we could get more from around the country, we would be grateful. Yeah, and we're showing our viewers the website right now, politicalpartytime.org. And you can see right there on the front page that you can send them an invitation and upload it onto their website. Our, our are, are people doing this voluntarily? I mean, uh, does this does this help a member of Congress in any way raise get more money in in their coffers? There actually are a few people who do send them in. Uh, they're mostly fundraising consultants that will email us and volunteer what you know their clients are doing or what fundraisers they're doing. Uh, a lot of people who give these to us are again you know sort of frustrated Washington people who are tired of being hit up by fundraising. Some of them are just public spirited or public minded. But you know, some members really do want uh, the you know the word to go out that uh, that they're raising money. I mean, the vast majority of them, I don't think, are that crazy about it. And again, there's not a whole lot of disclosure around this. And this is kind of one of Sunlight's uh, attempts to do disclosure to members of Congress and make them transparent whether they want to be or not. Uh, one invitation that's happening uh, that would, that uh, one party that's happening this week on Monday night. There it is. The invitation for a fundraiser for Senator Tim Kaine. So is this invitation, I mean, who, who is this invitation coming from and who will be at this type of event? It's a Beyonce's concert here in Washington uh, at the Verizon Center. It comes from uh, the campaign of, of Senator Tim Kaine. Sometimes they will come from a leadership pack associated with the member of Congress. In this case, it's, it's actually his campaign. And they have a list that they send it to. And you know, each campaign has its own email list. Sometimes they share lists. And it will go out to heads of trade associations here in Washington, lobbyists, uh, the Washington offices of you know big companies like maybe Boeing or um, you know the big contractors that are in town, uh, the big law firms in town, and you know Washington is one of the hubs for raising money, and so and those are the kinds of folks that will be there. And they're generally speaking, it will be people who uh, oftentimes will have an issue before a committee that Senator Warner sits on. A lot of times members list the committees that they're on for helpful reference for people getting the invitation. Um, and, you know, this is a chance for these folks to, you know, kind of mingle with a member of Congress 
at a, you know a Beyonce concert. Yeah, and you have a blog going about these uh, party um, in and, and who's attending for this Beyonce concert. I mean, how many people, members of Congress, were holding fundraisers around this event in Washington? I mean, it wasn't just. Democratic Senator Tim Kaine. Right, there are actually three members who are holding uh, uh, this host, you know, hosting events around this uh, this concert, and we see this a lot. You know, concerts are a big draw. We also see a lot of sporting events, um, you know, Nationals games. A lot of times, if there's an out of out of town team, let's say Chicago Cubs coming to town, you'll have a Chicago delegation hosting a night, or members of Chicago, from the Chicago delegation hosting an event uh, at Nationals Park. Um, we also see it for you know hockey, basketball. Um, so this has been kind of a, um, you know, anytime you can get, you know, lobbyists into a skybox, that seems to be something that uh, members of Congress like to do. No, I also want to show our viewers an invitation that went out uh, for Senator Rand Paul and other senators mm -hmm. as well. Beer, bourbon, and barbecue, a fundraiser for uh, Senator Paul. Explain a little bit about this one. Well, this is, you know, one of these things, you know, one of the most interesting things is that, you know, a lot of times, and actually there's been a, a Yale political science study looking at this, that sometimes it's the members who host fundraisers for somebody else are the ones who end up with the political chits. You know, they're going to have like a, for the, you know, a lot of times we see like Eric Cantor or John Boehner or Nancy Pelosi hosting fundraisers for other members. Um, and what, because they've helped a, you know, somebody who has less name recognition, less prominence raise money, um, a lot of times, according to this Yale political science study, uh, you have people voting the way of the member who hosts it. Uh, this is kind of a, you know, in many ways a typical event where you have, uh, uh, you know, it's amazing how the number of these that we see that involve some kind of alcohol, you know, we've seen them martinis, martinis, martinis. Uh, one of my favorites in 2006, there was a block party on C Street, which is right outside the Capitol here, where some members have residences and there were five Republican members who all had there were you know margaritas with this person and martinis with that person and you know, each member had a different drink in their house so um, uh, you know this is the kind of thing that we see an awful lot but I think you know the and the all seriousness though let's, re let's remember who's showing up at these to uh, have these drinks, and it's again Washington insiders, lobbyists, and special interests. All right, well, let's get our viewers involved. Oh, by the way, on Twitter, tweets in this what we need to do is outlaw lobbying, have debates paid for by government but moderated only by the public, else, no need to talk ethics. Michael in White Plains, New York, Democratic caller, you're up first on this. Go ahead, Michael. Michael, you're on the air. One last try here for Michael, White Plains, New York, Democratic caller. Okay. Yeah, I do. Okay, go ahead, Michael. I'm sorry, I hear you. Okay. Question or comment? I'm sorry. My opinion is that they should have a, the president should have a single year term, should have a single term, public funding for all federal elections, a strong, powerful election, instead of state limit what the candidates can spend airtime, and all senator congressional have strict limits and what the party can give. Bill Allison. You know, there's a number of uh, folks who are, you know, say basically the same thing. The one-term president is not something I've heard before, uh, or something I've heard before is not one of the um, kind of campaign finance proposals, uh, although term limits were kicked around for members of Congress back in the 90s. Um, you know, clearly, you know, obviously if you get away, do away with private fundraising by members of Congress, you would see these fundraisers disappear. Um, uh, you know, whether or not that's going to happen, you know, I'm not really sure. Um, you know, it's not been a really popular um, idea with members of Congress, although, again, this is one of the reasons why we do the party time site is a lot of members of Congress do complain all the time about fundraising, but we show, you know, how much time they spend doing it, and some of them are quite creative, as, you know, you see with, you know, barbecue and bourbon or martinis, 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 or say concerts, that, you know, um, this is something that members do, and, uh, and some of them are quite good at it. We're talking about fundraising efforts by members of Congress with the 2014 elections around the corner. This from the Sunlight Foundation's website, Lucky 13, House Challengers with the best second quarter hauls. And they write this, the 2014 elections may be 16 months away, but second quarter fundraising reports filed this week show a number of challengers already showing off some big numbers to the incumbent House lawmakers they want to unseat. And we can show you. Uh, some of those numbers as we continue talking with Bill Allison of the Sunlight Foundation, editorial director about fundraising efforts in Washington. Here are the lines, Democrats 202-585-3880, Republicans 202-585-3881, and Independents, all others, 202-585-3882.
Let's hear from Brian next in Michigan Independent Caller. Hi, Brian. Hi, good morning. Good morning. morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, two quick points. If this is business for which the lobbyists, they believe we need them, 15,000 lobbyists from Washington, D.C., if I do the math, they're basically talking to 3,000 of our government uh, members. That would be the House, the Senate, the White House, and all of their staff members. They're a the rough number, so you've got a five-to-one ratio. All lobbying should be done in their government offices or at the place of business who is lobbying them. It's okay. So, Allison? Well, you know, we would love to see better lobbying disclosure as a first step towards that, and, um, you know, uh, there are, um, you know, there are um, some agencies, uh, the, um, the um, Federal Reserve, Treasury Department, and others that around Dodd-Frank lobbying started to put their meetings online, what they were having. Uh, we saw some of this around the recovery that the Obama administration did. We would love to see the same thing for members of Congress to disclose that kind of information. Um, I think you see a lot of, you do see a lot of meetings outside of, of um, um, the official channels, you know, when the White House releases its visitors' logs, um, you know, showing who comes into the White House and who visits, and what staffers in the White House were doing to avoid that kind of disclosure was meeting with their registered lobbyists at a Caribou Cafe just a couple blocks from the White House uh, so that you wouldn't have the lobbyists coming in and triggering a visitor log event. Um, obviously, you know, it's much better to have those kinds of disclosures so you can see who's coming in to, um, you know, meet with elected officials. And I think the American public deserves it. And one of the things that Sunlight has pushed for is real-time lobbying disclosure, you know, not having to wait every quarter and, you know, have actual meetings of who is a lobbyist seeing on Capitol Hill. Right now they'll say they just met with the Senate or the House. Uh, we'd like to see which members they're actually meeting with. Radical tweets in, how about everything based on signatures? Take money completely out. Town, ha town hall debates only. Not enough signatures to get into, uh, not enough signatures to get into debate. We'll go to Royce in uh, Severn, Maryland, Democratic caller. Hi, Royce. Good morning. Good morning. You're on the air. I'm fine. How are you? Fine, Royce. What's your question or comment? Well, I was, oh, by the way, hi, Gwara. <laughs> I was going to ask him, why, why is it that, the, that this country has to spend, they, they expect that the next general election is going to cost this country close to $2 billion. To me, that's outrageous. I mean, we talk about all the problems that we have in this country and that these politicians can go out and spend that kind of money and don't blink an eye. It's a huge amount of money in elections right now, and you know a lot of this is driven by TV time and how much it costs to advertise and all of the air wars. And there's a you know a question in my mind as to how effective that is. You know, I think that at some point you get to overkill, but that's really what's driving this. And um, you know, and I agree with you. It's absolutely crazy. The uh, we, we told you about the Sunlight Foundation's reporting on the 2014 election, 16 months away. There are 13 races that uh, you highlight on your website. Um, those Republicans um, uh, and, and Democrats who are challenging incumbents. Just show you the numbers. Uh, Democratic Rep. Mike Honda is being challenged, and his challenger, a million dollars versus his 345,000. Bob Dole, the Republican in Illinois, challenging Democratic Rep. Brad Schneider. He has uh, 386, the incumbent that is, 1,000. Bob Dole, about 546,000. And uh, Mike Kaufman, a Republican in uh, Colorado, being challenged by Andrew Romanoff, another uh, rematch there. And then also it notes in here uh, that uh, Nan Hayworth is going to, trying to uh, win back her seat uh, as well, featured in uh, Sunlight Foundation's website if you want to go there and, and find out the latest on 2014 fundraising. Matt's next in Nebraska City, uh, Nebraska, Republican caller. Hi, Matt. Hi, how are you? Good morning. Good. Uh, my question for Mr. Allison would be, uh, after all of the money that these congressmen and senators receive through super PACs and through his contributions, is how much do they get to keep after everything is said and done, even after they leave office? You know, it used to be that members of Congress could turn their campaign accounts uh, and basically, you know, use it for their own personal expenses. That was changed back in the 1990s or an ethics reform that eliminated that, and so what members can do with it, they can give it to a nonprofit organization, including, for example, a 501c4. Uh, these are the you know social welfare organizations like Crossroads GPS that spent so much without disclosing their donors. 
Uh, they can also uh, give it to a, uh, they can also continue to use it as sort of a political uh, influence mechanism. A lot of members, when they leave Congress, become lobbyists in Washington and having their own political action committee, which they convert their campaign committee to, can be useful. And so really they can keep, as long as they don't use it for things like buying yachts or, uh, or playing golf for things that you're not allowed to do with the money. As long as, they, as long as they use it to try to influence politics, they can keep every single dime that they have left over and spend it on those types of activities. Daryl's next, Preston, Missouri, independent caller. You're on the air with Bill Ellison of the Sunlight Foundation. Go ahead. Um, hi. Um, I think uh, they should tax uh, campaign contributions when they receive them and when they spend them, maybe 50%. Uh, that's, you know, that's not a crazy idea. Um, right now, all political committees are tax-free, and, you know, when you donate to, you, you don't get a tax deduction as a donor when you give to the committee, but the committee itself, when it raises money, doesn't have to pay taxes on it. Uh, one thing, incumbents have a tremendous advantage. Uh, they raise a, money for longer. They have name recognition. They're in Washington. Political action committees give much more to incumbents than to challengers. And having some kind of tax on the leftover money might be a way to reduce that incumbent advantage. I don't think incumbents are ever going to vote for that for themselves. Uh, but I think the downside of those kinds of proposals is that members already spend so much time raising money and are already so beholden in some ways to special interests that if you taxed it, they would have to raise, and they would raise, that much more money. Um, so you have people more dependent on special interests. Cecilia, in Mississippi, Democratic caller, Meridian, Mississippi. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I feel like all of that hoopla they were talking about, about the IRS and the 504 funds, I think that's what they were saying. I think whether you're Republican or Democrat, I really think that they need to stop giving these people so many tax deductions. What they're actually doing is becoming uh, the, it's for, the, for the rich and the powerful and the lobbyists and the regular people don't have any say so because we don't have that kind of money and i think they all should be taxed and i think the government does not have a right to exclude these people from being taxed and giving our money away or letting them not pay their fair share okay cecilia bill allison yeah, the only thing I'd, I'd add is is that you know these groups that do operate tax-free you know again for the political mm -hmm. ones that which are the 501 c4s that are involved in the irs uh, controversy and also were hugely impactful on the the 2012 elections or at least spent a lot of money i think not all of them got the results they wanted like crossroads gps which i think spent something like 70 million dollars and most of it did not go to winning candidates. Uh, they spent a lot backing um, Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney and some Republican Senate candidates who didn't win. But in any case, uh, these groups get the tax exemption. The donors to the groups, though, it's not tax deductible when they give the money uh, to these organizations. And there are a lot of 501c4 organizations that do wonderful work. And there are you know, social welfare organizations, there are community groups, there are uh, civic associations. So it's the bulk of them, I think, are okay. It's really these few political ones. There may be a few hundred that we know about that were active in the 2012 election that are causing, you know, all of the controversy. Irish Boy tweets in, in first order of business should be to get the private money out of politics. President Obama once championed individual donors, now like all the rest. And Gary tweets in, can't we limit elections like they do in England to 16 weeks and mandate TV ads? Can't be played last month. Make them come see us. And Sea Dog wants to know how would you reform campaign funding? Oh boy! I mean, you know, this is the big problem, and I'm very good at pointing out the problems. I really don't know how to fix the system. If I did, um, I, you know, I would be happy to tell you. Um, there are a number of different proposals for fixing campaign finance. You know, in terms of limiting the amount of money to doing away with limits and having instant disclosure. Um, I'm skeptical that you'll ever be able to get money completely out of the system, and largely it's because what government does is important, and government has an awful lot of money itself to give away, and can also, through regulations and rulemaking processes, cost people a lot of money, and this is why you see so much money flowing into the system. We're talking with uh, Sunlight Foundation's editorial director, Bill Allison. We about, have about 15 minutes left here to talk about uh, fundraising efforts and the Sunlight Foundation marking their blog and website, politicalparty.org, politicalpartytime.org, marking five years now that you've been keeping track of the political parties, the fundraising 
uh, parties that happen here in Washington. And if you go to their website, politicalpartytime.org, you can see where if you've come across an invitation, you yourself can upload it and send it to the Sunlight uh, Foundation. Dan in McLean, Virginia, Democratic caller. Hi, Dan. Hi. Uh, I have a question about what you think uh, the Citizens United decision has done to impact fundraising in Congress. Boy, um, it's really pushed it to the roof. And I think that, you know, when you look at the impact of Citizens United, it, I think it's much bigger on congressional races. If you're a House member and somebody spends $100,000 on advertising in your district, in a presidential campaign, $100,000 is a drop in the bucket. For a House member, that's a huge amount of money. And so what you have is House members proactively trying to raise enough money to fend off any kind of outside spending like this. And it's created this sort of ongoing uh, escalation in the amount that members are raising. And, you know, this is why, um, you know, if you have the 2012 election over, uh, the very next day, uh, Mitch McConnell, Republican majority leader, who's up for re-election in 2014, is holding a fundraiser. I mean, you know, we've just gotten through one big campaign cycle. And they kick off the next one the day after the election. Lynn Hawley Hansen tweets in, term limits must happen in public funding for elections. What can we do now to help move this forward? Um, you know, I think this is one of these uh, questions where what you really need for uh, both of these is, uh, you know, citizen movements, write your members of Congress. They do listen to letters. Uh, you can, you know, check sunlightfoundation.com. We have a number of proposals for uh, at least making the system more transparent and more open to people. And, um, uh, you know, and, and beyond that, you know, I think it's just something you have to keep your eye on and have to keep on, uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways of organizing and pushing for these things. And, you know, it's, I, mean, I think it's really in some ways up to citizens. But check out sunlightfoundation.com as a first step. Communist dog, Sea Dog wants to know, are bundlers able to deliver campaign do donations to representatives in their government offices? Um, that's... Uh, in government office, you're not supposed to do fundraising on Capitol Hill or in government offices. And uh, now, whether or not that happens, or people mention it, I mean, if fundraising does come up, you know, we've heard anecdotally in congressional meetings, so it's not as if this has never happened before. Um, but you know, members are not supposed to raise money uh, while they're uh, at fundraising. And one of the things that you know, I, I think you know about all these events that we have. Uh, I talked to a, uh, somebody who's a lobbyist and been a lobbyist for a long time about fundraising. And he says, you know, somebody's having their event on February 2nd. He goes to the event, he shows up, and he says, it's not like, you know, a movie theater where you're buying a ticket. You know, I show up, I go to the fundraiser, I talk to who I need to talk to. At the end of the quarter, which would be, you know, March 31st, that's when I mail my check. Um, you know, at the very tail end, you see a lot of checks coming in at the end. So a lot of times it's not so much that, you know, it's a little bit more sophisticated than somebody handing over cash to a member of Congress while he's at his job. Uh, it's much more subtly played out, and you know a lot of these folks in Washington are very the ethics rules, and are pretty careful. Matt Smith tweets in: "There's only one solution to our current nightmare: ban all campaign donations, as the corruption they are. We need public funding." Dave Crumlin, Pennsylvania, Republican caller. Hi, Dave. Hi. Good morning, brother. Good morning. Bill, how are you doing? Um, Bill, question for you: um, Do you think some of the trepidation on parties to release names of donors is due to? Um, being, uh, they're afraid of being singled out or in light of what happened with the whole IRS thing, they're afraid of maybe being um, subjected to more um, personal audits? And if so, do you envision more Caribou Cafe type events occurring? Well, you know, yeah, one of the things I'll say about that, you know, anytime you come up with a rule, there's already some lobbyist who's like three steps ahead and has figured out how to get around it. Um, and this is why they make a lot more money than I do. But um, as far as, uh, you know, the dis disclosure, I mean, right now, you know, even super PACs, uh, the groups like American Crossroads disclose their donors, campaigns have to disclose their donors, political parties have to disclose their, donor their donors. Uh, there is a movement right now. Uh, some, um, you know, lawyers are pushing against disclosure. These are a lot of state court cases. Uh, you know, there's always sort of this tension in the campaign finance world with people trying to, uh, at the same time, you have, you know, folks who are trying to impose limits or get reforms. You have folks who are trying to chip away at them and do away with those kinds of disclosures. You know, one of the big uh, examples of this was the Prop 8 campaign in California and people who donated to uh, groups that were in favor of banning gay marriage or marriage equality. 
uh, were singled out and were put on websites, and this is an argument, oh, well, these people will face violence for giving to a C4 group. Um, you know, obviously the IRS scandal does not make anybody happy, and it makes people worry that, you know, if you get involved politically, you may be, you know, sticking your neck out and get it audited. Uh, and this is, you know, an unfortunate side effect of the IRS scandal is that, you know, trust in government institutions has gotten a lot lower. And, you know, you need to be able to trust these government institutions. This is why I think, you know, we really do need to get to the bottom of the IRS scandal. But that being said, I don't think any of these reasons are a legitimate reason not to disclose right now. And if you disclose everybody uh, and only some people are getting audited, that's the best way to realize uh, that, this, that there's abuses happening. A call. For, uh, here's a tweet from uh, one of our viewers who's responding to the term limits. Uh, that many people are, are tweeting in about supporting that. And, he, and this uh, viewer says, if more term limits, more money needs to be spent getting public acquainted with new candidates equals more campaign fundraising. That could be the case. I mean, and Sunlight really does not have a position on term limits. I should be clear about, you know, we care about transparency. Um, you know, one of the things that can happen with term limits is that you can also have lobbyists have more influence. We've seen this somewhat in state legislator, legislatures where states that have term limits, uh, the lobbyists are the people who have been there the longest. You have a legislator who may be there for six years and gone, and the lobbyist has been there for 20 years. They know all the ins and outs of the legislation, and lawmakers get more and more dependent upon them. So that's a, a, you know, another problem with, with term limits. Um, uh, and then, you know, and obviously, you know, yes, you know, name recognition is one of the key things for getting people elected, and to get name recognition when you don't have it, yes, you have to spend a lot of money. Gordon, Little Neck, New York, independent caller. Uh, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Um, how can I, as a private citizen, uh, find out about my local congressman who is representing a predominantly poor, working-class Queens and South Bronx, and there's allegations that he now has $7 million in his campaign fund? Um, you know, the, the uh, sunlightfoundation.com has a, on our, uh, we have a link to tools. Uh, one of the tools is a site called influenceexplorer.com. You can put your member of Congress in there and see how much he's raising, see how money and who he's raising money from. Uh, that's one place to go. Um, there are several other websites uh, that, you know, provide this kind of information. A shout out to opensecrets.org, which is a group center for responsive politics that Sunlight supports. Uh, they also make campaign finance available, and they do have that kind of cash-on-hand information. Um, and uh, those are the two main places I would send you to. Steve, next. Phoenix, Arizona, Democratic caller. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for C-SPAN, and uh, thank you for taking my question. And here it is. I come from trucking, where everything's about efficiency. Uh, most efficient engine, least expensive truck, quite frankly, least expensive truck driver and all in the effort to lower the price to encourage uh, customers to come over for market share. And um, all this is done in the name of business. And what I don't understand is how come businesses are allowed to donate um, money to campaigns because, um, well, that seems like the worst business decision ever, giving somebody something that you can have no expectation of anything in return for. You know what I mean? So uh, wh why is... I understand why the people, all voters are allowed to donate, but I don't understand why corporations are, or any type of company, and I work in one. Can you help me? Uh, well, actually, corporations are not allowed to give directly to federal candidates, political parties, political action committees. I mean, this is employees of the companies, and when we talk about a particular company has you know, given X amount of money, what we're really talking about is their political action committee, which is money donated by their employees, and then individual contributors who might add to that. Um, but that being said, one of the reasons that I think that you do have, you know, corporations which do sponsor the political action committees themselves and spend, spending money on lobbyists as well is, is that they do think they're going to get a benefit out of it. And this is why, you know, we just saw an election with, uh, you know, $2 billion spent is that, or close to $2 billion spent is that, you know, all of these interests giving this money think that they get something out of it. <clears throat> Tim in uh, Adrian, Michigan, Democratic caller. Hi, Tim. Tim, uh, my question is, with all the deadlock in Congress, why can't we come up with a system that during maybe a presidential four-year term that there couldn't be, uh, say, two major issues that are brought up on a ballot for the American people to vote on? Things like... Uh, 
the gun reform, where 90% of Americans are want one thing, but yet we do the lobbyists and we can't push that through and things like that. Um, you know, a lot of states do have ballot issues, and one of the things that we see when they have ballot issues is that you have special interest spending of fortune. Uh, Washington State had a referendum on, you know, could retailers sell uh, alcohol, and Costco spent, uh, I think it was like $16 million pushing that initiative. Uh, so you, you still see the special interest money um, when you do have issues like that. And you ended a lot of advertising trying to convince people that, this is the most wonderful ballot measure ever, or this is the worst thing that ever happened. So I still, still think you'd see a lot of the spending and a lot of the attempts to influence the people. But at the federal level, we have no mechanism for, you know, kind of direct democracy. And that was, you know, the founder's decision and it would take a constitutional amendment if you were going to have something like that. What uh, laws governing ethics and, and lobbying have been passed recently? And what do they say? Boy, I mean, I think, you know, one of the most important ones is with, um, um, was the 2007, which is a while back, but the um, uh, Honest Leadership and Open Government Act, and there we got um, disclosure of lobbyists when they, they have to disclose when they make campaign contributions, they have to disclose when they run a political action committee. I mean, a lot of times when a lobbyist walks into a member of Congress's office, what you're seeing is, you know, what a member sees is somebody who can not just give $2,600 to his campaign, but might be controlling another $5,000 from um, uh, uh, his uh, PAC that he runs for his firm and, and $15,000 from PACs that he runs from other firms. So all of this has to be disclosed now that a lobbyist, and when they give that money, um, uh, that was, I think, one of the most important ones that we've had recently. And this graphic from the New York Times, when this was uh, put into law, the Honest Leadership and Open Government Act of 2007, generally prohibits lobbyists from giving gifts or travel to members of Congress or their aides, and increases the civil penalty for violations to 200,000 from 50,000, and provides up to five years in prison for criminal violations. Peter, Howard Beach, New York, independent caller. Hi, Peter. Hi. Um, I'd like to know... Uh... This is actually a two-part question. I'd like to know if uh, the Sunlight Foundation is associated with uh, any of the Democratic Party, because they keep mentioning the Republicans. I notice they haven't mentioned the Democrats. Also, when it comes to uh, the unions, in 2008, the unions spent over $400 million on elections, yet they're still a 413C. In other words, they're not-for-profit. I'm curious why they're allowed to keep that tax-exempt status. Uh, the Sunlight Foundation is not affiliated with any Democratic organization, and we've actually had plenty of Democrats complaining about our coverage over the years. Uh, we are nonpartisan, uh, straight down the middle. Uh, as far as um, the labor unions, are actually 501c5 is the tax uh, uh, group. They are nonprofit, and and essentially this is just the part of the tax code under which they're organized. Um, you know, that's what these numbers refer to, sections of the tax code, and it defines what a labor union can and can't do. And, you know, over the year, a lot of them have spent uh, a fortune on politics. $400 million actually sounds low to me for the 2008 election, but, um, uh, you know, we know that some of the biggest donors to members of Congress uh, and campaigns are labor unions, and they are very politically active. Milgram's mistake tweets in, uh, vote candidates out. Don't term limits them. Don't term limit them. It is undemocratic. Doug in D.C., Democratic caller. Go ahead, Doug. Doug, you with us? Yes, hello? Yep, go oh, ahead. Sorry, thanks for taking my call. Uh, I was wondering, uh, this issue often, the issue of campaign finance reform often gets uh, broken down in politics with Republicans often opposed and Democrats often in, in favor. What type of action or argument could be made to Republicans, voters as well as the party, to encourage them to get on board with campaign finance reform law? Thanks. I mean, you know, I, I hate to say, I mean, I th often think it's self-interest. You know, one of the things that we saw, there was a New York Times story shortly after the 2012 elections where some Republican members of Congress were questioning the wisdom of the Citizens United ruling because they're going to be up for re-election soon. These were, uh, I believe, senators. I think John Cornyn of Texas was one of them. Um, and the concern was, well, gee, I'm going to have to raise all this money now. So usually self-interest is the way to appeal to uh, you know, legislators. Now, I don't know if you get the best campaign finance reform that way. You know, a lot of times what you end up with is that the incumbents end up with an advantage 
uh, that challengers don't get. And I think that that was one of the criticisms of some of the provisions of McCain-Feingold, including things like the Millionaire's Amendment, that uh, incumbents would be able to raise extra money if they were running against a millionaire who was challenging them and using his own money. Um, so that's, um, but, um, but really it's, it's usually self-interest that appeals. And then the other thing is if there's a big scandal, then both sides want to do something to fix the system. For more information, go to sunlightfoundation.com. Bill Ellison, Editorial Director, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you for having me.